Welcome to the Designated Drinker Show, the podcast that's raising the bar on craft cocktails. I am your host, Louise Solis, and with me, as always, is my very, very talented friend, who is my Joan Holloway and Roger Sterling, all wrapped up in one. She's an extra DC Gina. <laughs> so I'm supposed to know those people, all right? I knew you wouldn't, but you know, uh, when I get into it, it will make sense. It'll make sense. Though I will tell you, they're probably the two sexiest people on the show, but okay. What show? Exactly. So I was definitely into Mad Men, and obviously it was not your cup of tea. That would require watching television, right? Yes, it would. It. it would, it would, it would. Or you're, you know, you can stream everything as the kids do no, now. No, I will. I will stream yep. it. So um, creative director Don Draper, who I obviously relate to, right? Uh, he, now, he, may, he was definitely the leading man on the show, but the real hero of that show was the alcohol that he drank every day in his office when you laughed that I had wine glasses in my office. Absolutely, this is what you do as a creative director, have liquor in your office. It's the only way you get through advertising. Now, Don, as I like to call him, typically had rye whiskey or bourbon. And in fact, on the show, um, the first thing Peggy, the kind of cool, Peggy Olson was her name, she was his secretary, but she was actually the first female copywriter. And that isn't far from the real truth, because I actually met the real Peggy Olson. But anyway, Joan, Joan Holloway, who was his secretary before, her advice to Peggy was to always keep a bottle of something in your desk. M Mr. Draper drinks rye. Um, and so I think that maybe even you, Gina, might have considered working in this office. Just maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of sex, a lot of alcohol. <laughs> it sounds like a bar. <laughs> pretty much, it's advertising. It's not really far I went, from I that. went a different route. I just worked in a bar. Yeah, exactly. It's pretty much the same. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, from somebody who grew up in advertising, absolutely. Um, and the crazy thing is now, whis whiskey was already starting to see its resurgence when Mad Men uh, launched. But they actually, it's credited for... Um, really highlighting and reigniting the culture around classic classic whiskey cocktails. Like mainstreaming it. Yeah, yeah, making them cool again. Yeah. Because it was such a hipster show, and so well done, well written, well art directed, and they drank amazing cocktails. Oh, I thought I'll be bidding watching that at the beach. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when my kids go to bed. Yeah, yeah I don't know, that it's definitely not kid friendly. <laughs> well, I know, when my kids go to bed. I'm like, yeah, exactly. They go to bed early, I'm like, oh, okay, well, I'll just sit here now and wait. So, uh, Gina, I'm sure, and correct me if I'm wrong, you started to see a change in drinking culture in about 2010, yeah? Uh, yeah, but before, a little before that for me, I was in New York. So, you know, like, it, it took a little, it took a minute for it to get down yeah. to D.C. Yeah, it took but a, a lot of few more minutes to get everywhere else, but yeah. Yeah. So, ironically, this is about the same time our next designated drinker started immersing herself and definitely her taste buds into whiskey culture. Please welcome to the show Maggie Kimbrell, content editor of American Whiskey Magazine. Welcome to the show, Maggie. Hello. Thank you for having me. Oh, You're welcome. So good to have you. So, um, Maggie, tell us, how did you um, get started? How did you end up, like, taking a head dive, like, right into the whiskey world and start writing in this space. This is a, a really fun story, and I feel like everybody has heard it by now, but I keep telling it anyway. Um, so when my kids were little, I worked part-time at the liquor store. So um, my husband would come home from work and I would, I would go to work three nights a week. And um, I, I wanted to initially learn a lot about wine and figured out really quickly that wine people were not my people. And then I kind of was like looking at the craft beer stuff and it's it was kind of becoming the same as wine at that point where craft beer bros were, you know, really making it a not very welcome space. And so I've always been really into the farm to table movement, uh, the locavore movement, uh, you know, different environmental causes around food. And I started looking at the bourbon aisle and I was like, hey, you know, they make that right down the street. Maybe I should start learning about it. So I started to learn a little bit about it. And that was back in the days when master distillers would come in and sit and sign bottles and do tastings and nobody knew who they were. Um, so this is like, um, you know, 2010 ish. So um, I started meeting all these master distillers, learning about bourbon. And then one week during Derby week, uh, Jim Rutledge 
was with Four Roses at the time, and he was in the store doing a tasting and a bottle signing. And I kept trying to go talk to him, and every time I would leave the cash register, a whole horde of people would come in, because everything Derby Week in Kentucky is pandemonium. No matter, like, the park, it's crazy. The store, it's crazy. Everything is pandemonium. I bet. Um, Especially the liquor store. Yeah. And so it was like that for the whole, like, you know, two, three, four hours, however long he was there. And so then he was packing up to leave and I had to go on break. And I was like, womp, womp, I guess I'll meet Jim Rutledge next year. And so I went and sat down in the break room and was eating my sad little peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And the next thing I knew, he came through the door with bottles in one hand and cups in the other hand. And he was like, you didn't get to do my tasting. And he sat down with me and he taught me, you know, a little bit about the history of Four Roses, the 10 different recipes, which recipes are in which bottle, the proper bourbon tasting technique. And I was like, oh my God, who does this? Like, this is amazing. And then my next thought after that was, I have to tell the whole world about this. So shortly after that, I quit my job and started writing about whiskey. And, um, you know, it's been a pretty wild ride. I think I came into it at the perfect time, I think. Um, I People ask me all the time, like, oh, how do I get to do what you do? And first of all, I'm like, one, you don't want this. Um, <laughs> and, and two, I... Care for what you ask Right, for. exactly. Um, and, and two, like, I, I don't know... Um, you know, like I, people, people definitely do not realize what they're asking for. And two, I don't know that this could be duplicated again. So, you know, it's, it's, it's really weird sitting where I'm sitting because like, I just had the spark at the, per, you know, serendipity or kismet as my, my yeah. friend Joan calls it. Um, so it was, it was right place, right time. Yep. Yep. I think, I think that happens a lot, but I, I also think that it's not just by happenstance. I mean, you, you did take, you did take a leap of faith and, you know, you did like just leaving one job and having the audacity to start something new. That takes, it might've been right time, right place, but it did take a little bit of some, some, uh, Moxie. There you go. Moxie. Thank you. Balls. To make it happen. To make Balls this. Balls is my middle name. Kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Seriously. It really does. I mean, you have little kids, you said, Yeah, so they're 13 and 15 now. So they've kind of been along on this journey with me the whole time. Um, It's really funny. Like, I have, I I worked with Buffalo Trace once to put together a uh, kid-centered bourbon distillery tour because, you know, like, I I think it's something, I, I see this as an extension of agriculture. And so because this is such a huge part of our economy in Kentucky, there are going to be a lot of kids who are going to end up working in this industry. And so I think that they need to understand what options are out there. And there are a lot of people who are like, oh, no, why would you take a kid to a bourbon distillery? I'm like, because they might work there someday and they need to know what it's about and, you know, like that that's an option for them. Um, So we had a a really lovely tour. Freddie Johnson was our tour guide. And he taught them all about like, you know, why this is called Buffalo Trace, because the buffalo used to cross the river here. And, uh, you know, they about how the barrels work and they got to roll barrels, empty barrels in the warehouse. And, you know, it was just like these these really interesting things that you wouldn't see if your focus was on the end product. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I think that's actually really smart. It's a it's a it's a very um European approach to uh you know like like winemakers families. Sure. Like right? If you were a winemaker's family, you would 100% teach your children from the beginning when they're little, they learn. Yeah. They learn to swirl that glass right off the jump and like and like you, you, you would sit. It's not uncommon to sit at a table, and they would be like a couple of drops of the wine, and then water all the way for the kids. Like that is a real thing. Yep. I mean, my family's from Italy, and like, you know, especially if you have generational winemakers, and we don't do that here. Right. A lot of times, it isn't generational. The distilleries will be bought and sold. Yeah. Which is um, is unfortunate, and like that would be a, that's a very interesting thing to do to like show that like. This is how, like, the economy um, can work and, you know, how to make money in a different way. Because, like, you show them how to grow tomatoes. Yeah. You show them all these things. Yeah. I mean, we're starting to see, like, kind of a resurgence of this um, farmer distiller 
kind of a thing. And so I see a lot of people uh, like Whiskey Acres in in Illinois. Um, you know, Nick will post pictures of his kids in the distillery or out on the farm doing harvest and stuff like that. And there are a lot of families like that where, you know, it is definitely a family business. And, you know, the distilled product, that's just the end product of this entire process that the whole family is involved in. When do you think that this might be to kind of the remnants of like the Tempers um, uh, era, and it actually probably goes all the way back to like the Puritan, uh, the Puritans that came over and on the Mayflower. I mean, that came over because things were demonized. Things like spirits were uh, not a were seen as a negative. You hit the nail on the head. So a lot of the things that are really weird about this industry are remnants of prohibition. And prohibition, you're absolutely right, got that uh, kind of boost from, you know, there there was a reason that prohibition, there were lots of reasons why prohibition happened. I mean, we really needed reform in this industry uh, to prevent it from getting to that point, but it had to get to that point. You know, there were a few people who were doing things like, hey, I'm going to... George Garvin Brown was the first person to exclusively consumer package his his whiskey. So he would put it in a bottle, put a seal on it so that you would know what you were getting and that it was safe. There were a lot of people who were not doing that. Uh, you know, the, the primary um, packaging was the barrel. Whiskey was sold by the barrel and you would take your jug down to the tavern and fill it up. Um, and it, you, you never knew what you were going to get. And then there were people who were like, hey, I'm going to buy this new make spirit and I'm going to add like... Um, tobacco spit and uh, prune juice and all, you know, all this like rattlesnake heads and all this nasty stuff to it. Uh, Sulfuric acid. And, you know, so it has that bite and uh, you know, you never knew what you were going to get. So that was one thing. And then the other thing was, uh, you know, after the civil war, that was the first Napoleonic style war to be fought with modern weapons. And there were a lot of people who had just really terrible what we would call today PTSD from that. And there was a lot of drinking and a lot of drunkenness. And then you add to that, like, you know, just the day-to-day difficulties of working, uh, you know, either an agrarian lifestyle or, you know, a factory life or, you know, whatever people were doing back then. There were a lot of people, there were a lot of reasons why people were drinking too much. And there were a lot of reasons why prohibition uh, came to fruition. Um, But one of the things that happened uh, when prohibition ended was that, Everybody got together and agreed, okay, if we end prohibition, then every state can make its own laws about how uh, beer, wine, and spirits are handled in the marketplace. And so we ended up with this three-tier system. Every beverage is is treated differently. Uh, Every time you cross an invisible line on a map, uh, the laws change. And so we have things like, you know, people are not able to wrap their heads around direct to consumer shipping right now. That's one of the big ones that I've written about um, in the last couple of years that it doesn't matter how many times I inform people, they're like, I don't get it. Um, and so, and I'm like, literally, you can't order bourbon and have it delivered to your house because prohibition. And they're like, but that was a hundred years ago. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> so that that's kind of a roundabout way to say like, yes, absolutely. Prohibition is still very much alive and well and with us. Yeah. How did the wine companies get around that then? Because you can get they wine. They had in. phenomenal marketing in the 70s and 80s and a lot of um, uh, lobbying. So that's how, you know, in the 70s and 80s, the California wine industry basically went in and, cha- you know, had all those laws, put all that money and time and effort into changing those laws. And then the lawmakers were like, well, you can get wine now. You don't really need anything else. Um, so, you know, and so we're, we're trying to modernize the spirit side of things now. Um, there's a really great organization called... Uh, Spirits United. And that's one of the things that they do is it's grassroots activism about, you know, getting these prohibition era laws repealed. So one of the things that they worked a lot on was being able to sell cocktails to go during the pandemic. And that was something that was basically illegal across the board, no matter where you went with a few exceptions. And they were able to get temporary measures in place. And those have turned into permanent measures in a few places. So, you know, consumers who want to be able to get cocktails to go or to get direct to consumer shipping of spirits or whatever 
I, I definitely encourage people to check out uh, Spirits United and, you know, join their mailing list and, and, you know, get on top of what advocacy they're doing on behalf of consumers. Huh. I've never heard of that. Did you know of that? Did you hear? Did you know of that? No, but I do appreciate that um, we were allowed to sell cocktails during, um, oh, absolutely. during I mean, the pandemic. It, it was a lifeline. And it is. It's permanent here in D.C. now, I believe. I believe I it's going to be right, permanent. Yeah. I think there are 11 states that have made it permanent, give or take. Virginia, I think, pushed it out for two years. They can, I think they can bring it back up to vote, but I think it's, I think it went for two Shocking. years. Shocking. Was that also because Virginia went Republican? Anyway, I, We all know that I did not vote that way, but. I'll stop. <laughs> yeah. I won't get into, I'm not going to even start that conversation. <laughs> I think you just did. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I think, you know, commerce-wise, it makes so much sense to be able to ship it. I, I, the laws are so, they just don't, you know, our lawmakers need a lot of help <laughs> in lots of well, areas. It's, it's not like, a you know, priority, told right? To like, because people assume, because it's been this way their entire lives, they assume that there's no ability to change that or that this is just how it, you, people people don't think about True. like hey i would really like to travel to florida and visit a distillery and have those bottles shipped back to me instead of having to schlep them on the plane and th- when they get there they realize that's not legal and they start going but but why and they've never thought about it before because you just go to the liquor store and you get whatever you want off the shelf and you go home and you go about your life. And that's just how it's always been. Um, and I think a lot of times it doesn't dawn on people that that's not an option until they're faced with it. Yeah. So what about what we didn't talk about is like cocktails to go is one thing. Um, but we're in while we're in this vein, what about like, you know, in D.C. during the pandemic, bars were allowed to sell their bottles straight to other bars or actually sell them outright to consumers. Do either of you know why that's not where that is and why that became? That's uh, a license. Like, yeah, that's that, just so, a different you, license. Is there a reason why it's different? You can get that license. Oh, you yeah. can get it before Prohibition. I oh, mean, yeah. before Prohibition, <laughs> before the pandemic. In yeah. all, in all? It, it's you have something. to have a separate inventory. Yeah, It's not okay. something, yeah. I, I don't know that that's something you can get across all 50 states in D.C., but that is something we definitely have in Kentucky, where we have uh, bar, certain bars that also have package sales. And that, that was something, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, I, I spoke to um, uh, Bill Thomas at Jack Rose right when everything was hitting yeah, the fan. Man. And, you know, yeah. he was, like, frantic. Like, I, I felt for him because... You know, I saw this video of people lined up around the block to come buy uh, all of his bought all of his inventory. He sold his inventory so that he could keep his staff paid and yep. keep it, you know, keep the lights yep. on and stuff. Um, and it was the same thing here in Kentucky. The Silver Dollar uh, has a, a sister location called the Pearl, and they are selling a lot of their inventory uh, over there. And, you know, there are just a lot of places that were doing that. And these are places that have stuff that you can't get anywhere else. And so, like, I was I was really concerned about how they were going to bounce back. But when I went to these places after everything, you know, kind of started coming back online, uh, you know, they they were able to restock a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, I went into Jack Rose uh, last November and I was like, Bill, this looks exactly the same as the last time I was here. How did you do this? He's like, oh yeah, I got this from this guy and I got this from this and I got this from here. And I was just like, I mean, I'm so glad that that was an op- that they were able to do both of those things. But yeah, package sales, uh, that's just a separate, separate license that you get. And I'm sure it differs Ooh. from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but yeah, that's, that's definitely a thing. Well, there you go. Now I know. You know what else I want to know? My, what? I want to know your tips and tricks for this week. Uh, I got a good one. I got a good one. Welcome to Tips and Tricks. All right. So my favorite time of year, I love stone fruit. I love peaches and nectarines and all of the things. And apricots are like one of my absolute favorite. But you know, apricots are one of those tricky ingredients that if you don't eat it within the perfect second of it, it becomes really mushy and kind of like, eh, I'm not going to eat it. Well, that's the best thing what we're going to do because we're going to turn that into an apricot syrup that you can use for both your cooking and for your cocktail making, right? So what you're gonna do is you're gonna get your apricots now and you could have like three apricots, five apricots, whatever, right? Whatever the amount of apricots is, you're gonna cut them in half 
like that. And you're gonna take out the pit because pits contain a little bit of arsenic and all of the stone fruits. And you're gonna take it out and you're gonna take it and you're gonna cover it with sugar. So generally, if you would, if you have a scale at home and if you don't have a scale at home to weighing your food, I highly encourage that you spend, you know, $10 on buying a scale because once you weigh it, then you can make the most perfect simple syrups because it's just by the weight, it's the same weight of each item to make simple syrup instead of just a measuring cup. So if you were making like, um, you know, regular simple syrup, it's one cup of sugar to one cup of water, but you can make it more precise when you're adding the, um, another factor into it, like adding apricots or stone fruits. So what this is, is one cup of sliced apricots in half, such as in half, and then it is one cup of sugar and one cup of water. And what I do is I put it all in a pot over a medium heat, and then I just keep slowly taking my spoon and just going around and pulling up my apricots. And as soon as the sugar melts, and you can see that the sugar is no longer in crystal form, I turn it off and I cover it and I leave it there for like until ever it gets to room temperature. So if your house is at, you know, 89 degrees, it's gonna get to room temperature. Then they say other people's houses that might be at 68 degrees. Um, so once it's at room temperature and you could do it, what you should be left with, because the apricot's so delicate, are these pieces of apricot. And these pieces of apricot are so wonderful and like seriously diversify, like um, it has a lot of um, diversity to it because you could take them and you could use them in your cooking. You can make sauces with them. You could um, use them in your cocktail. And what you're using for your cocktail is this beautiful liquid that's left. And if you see it, it's just like this golden color. And what I love about it is, cause you can use like a bar spoon of it, or you could use a half an ounce of it. And if you have children at home, one thing I love to do is take like two ounces of this and some sparkling water and make my kids interesting natural sodas that don't have a bunch of other ingredients in it or maybe add a little bit of lemon for like an apricot lemonade. And it's just like super easy, super fun and something that I like to keep in my arsenal of um, bar syrups like all year round. So that's my tip and you'll see my trick later. Apricot syrup, that's amazing, Jenny. You can do just about anything with that. You really can, you can use it for your kids, you can use it in your drinks, you can use the fruit that's in there, and you can put it on top of ice cream, pork chops. I just say pork chops. Pork yeah, chops. really, really, it's versatile. Pork chops. Pork chops. Sounds delicious. So where are they gonna go to get this tips and tricks? You're gonna go to designateddrinker.show, or you can follow us on Instagram at yes. designateddrinker. Yep. And, um, you know, just remember to hit like, because we don't know what you're saying unless you're DMing. Exactly. And asking questions, and I'm like, but you didn't even like it. I'll give you the answer, but. <laughs> yes, she'll answer your question, so do that. So if you need to find that link, it's very easy. Just go into episode notes. We'll have links to, obviously, designatedrinker.show as well as Instagram, so you can see Gina do it firsthand. <laughs> Teaching you like a pro. That's my pro tip. It's your pro tip. My, my pro tip is keep your vermouth in the fridge. Gina, why do people not know this? I We say it all the time. Every time, time. <laughs> every time. You know, I, I, have, I own lots of bars. People still take the vermouth and leave it on the oh counter. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you got a twofer in this there one. There you go. Um, that twofer brings us to the end of part one with Maggie Kimbrell, the content editor of American Whiskey Magazine. Um, and I know that if you're anything like Gina and I, um, a few sips is just not enough. And there's just never enough Maggie. So uh, top off your drink and check out um, part two of this episode as we're gonna continue our boozy banter as Gina shares her delicious Maggie-inspired cocktail recipe. Mm -hmm. Apparently it's got apricots. Mm -hmm. It does. Cheers. <laughs> the Designated Drinker Show is produced by Missing Link, a podcast media company that is dedicated to connecting people to intelligent, engaging, and informative content. Also in the Missing Link lineup of podcasts is Roger That, a podcast dedicated to guiding you through the haze of dementia, led by skilled caregivers Bobby and Mike Carducci. Now, if you're looking for a whole new way to enjoy the theater, check out Between Acts, an immersive audio theater podcast experience. Each episode takes you on a spellbinding journey through the works of newfound playwrights, from dramas to comedies and everything in between. Find Missing Link's League of Podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. 
please don't forget to subscribe, download, and review the shows. Your review helps our shows reach new audiences. To find out more about Missing Link, visit missinglink.company. That's missinglink.company.